record it and get started. All right. So any other quick questions before we get started? So remember that quiz five is due on Sunday again, like our normal time. And a bunch of y'all forgot about the one on Monday. So all right. Close. Um, connecting with biology one is due on Monday as well. Uh, make sure you're keeping up with that. If you have questions, and I know there are a lot of questions from everybody about this, so ask. It's not, it's not going to bother you if you do. Um, one thing to keep in mind, especially with this connecting with that one thing, is especially the first one. I'm not looking just for a boring summary of the paper you read. If I, if I wanted that, I would do it myself, right? I'm looking for you to interpret it and put it out in the world as like, the first person, this is what you thought about it kind of thing. Like how to like interact with the document if you want. And I know that sounds kind of weird, but try to avoid third person. Like this is science, but it's, you're supposed to interact with it. You're supposed to make it a little bit more lively, right? It's not supposed to be just boring and say, because again, if I want to use the summary of the paper, it's the gas for, right? So have a little bit of fun with it. I've seen a lot of people do some really cool creative stuff. In I'm not going to necessarily hold you against everybody else, like, or compare y'all. Like, you can get 100 even if you don't, like, do the most perfect one. But as long as you follow the rubric, but keep that in mind. All right. And don't forget, exam two is coming up. Um, get started on the thing that we just mentioned. And we're talking at 5% makes a difference. It doesn't sound like much, but, you know, going from an 85 to a 90 makes a big difference. Well. All right. Any other questions? Yeah. So I do not know yet. I've got a meeting with uh, somebody this week to just kind of like, so I have a mentor that kind of guides me on what I can and can't do. There's a lot of things that the department says that I can't control. That's one thing I'm trying to figure out. Keep in mind too that if it's an online exam, it will be done through respondents and I'll give you guys a decent amount of heads up. And given that, you know, it's not as easy just to like say, hey, it's in person, come here. Um, you have to like find a computer with a webcam and all that kind of crap. Um, one thing I will do is give you all the entire day to do it. So it will open at 12.01 on Friday morning. It'll go to Now, if you miss that time period, keep in mind if it's online, I'm going to be a little bit less flexible. With you. So if you're like actively sick with COVID, and you physically can't open up your computer, that's one thing. But if you're just on quarantine, you can do that. It's not, it's not as uh, forgiving of an option. Just something to think about. All right, any other questions? Cool. So today's lecture, we're gonna be going through the endocrine system. As we kind of mentioned, is that more chemical uh, side of the communication? Oh, sorry. Uh, let me switch that back with her. There we go. That better? Cool. Um, sorry about that. Um, but again, today we're going to be going through the endocrine system, which is again kind of that more chemical side of the body communication system. And keep in mind, too, especially with endocrine system, it's a lot about more slow and gradual changes compared to something like your nervous system, which is more immediate, rapid reactions to things. Now, like I just mentioned, hormones are designed for providing slow lasting communication. In other words, it's not just a single little electrical impulse or a bunch of them all at once. It's a long sustained effect on your body based off of how your body's sensors and effector centers think your body should change things. Keep in mind too, it's not like, it's not like your body's like thinking about these things per se. It's kind of almost more like a computer. If A, then B. It's all that logical operation. And you can, as a result of this, kind of have some situations where it doesn't quite always work out. Um, now, like I mentioned, the nervous system and the endocrine system are your body's two main communication networks. And this endocrine system is going to affect things at a much slower, but it's going to be much more longer lasting than any of the things your nervous system can do. Now, the endocrine system primarily consists of glands and hormones. So hormones are just kind of like a chemical that's going to be floating around your body. Keep in mind that, as we kind of mentioned earlier, chemicals aren't necessarily bad things. Like everything, a water is, you know, water is chemical, right? Everything is a chemical to some extent. So don't think like the woo-woo, anti-science, like chemicals are always bad mentality. Keep that in mind. 
Um, but ultimately, you have all these glands throughout your body that are usually designated as some sort of endocrine gland that are there to promote and uh, release uh, all these various hormones that your body needs to be able to function. So classic example of these, and we'll get to more of them, I'm sure, include everything from uh, the, or the glands that are present in the back of here. Um, you've got things that will sit right up on top of your kidneys, stuff that's integrated into the digestive tract, and we'll get more into the, the nitty gritty and specifics of that here in a second. Now, several different types of tissue make up the endocrine system. Obviously, you're gonna have some nervous tissue, but you're also gonna need those endocrine glands, which are there to, to uh, actually secrete the hormones. So for instance, you've got just kind of breaking down based off of those three main uh, tissue types. For epithelial tissue, this is gonna be stuff that makes up the bulk of most glands and secretes many different types of hormones. You're gonna have connective tissue, which is gonna be the blood that's gonna circulate around all these hormones through your body. Then finally, you have the nervous system or nervous tissue, which is gonna be parts of the brain stem as well as um, that are there that can secrete hormones themselves, as well as the sections of the brain that help to control and release others. And as well as the neurons that help to kind of promote uh, certain glands to release or make more hormones in different circumstances. Now, hormones can have incredibly powerful effects. They can affect your mood, your emotions, your feelings of sexual desire or, or just attraction in general, um, as well as development patterns such as puberty or metamorphosis. Yeah, the amount of And while some of that does have a basic basis in genetic control, you can do a lot more with the hormones itself by regulating how much and when, and to actually control how, how you develop in the first place. As a result, hormone levels are highly regulated. So these feedback loops that we mentioned, both positive and negative, are there to ensure that the endocrine glands adjust the secretion of all hormones to maintain that perfect level of homeostasis. This doesn't always happen. Um, I, for instance, my uh, mother-in-law, uh, she had to have her thyroid removed as a cancer. And so as a result, she has to actually take certain types of hormones because now that her thyroid is gone, she's missing that production center for those hormones and thus can't regulate it on her own. Now, ultimately, these hormones are going to interact with receptors in target cells. So kind of like in, a neuro, in you know, the nervous system, you have the neurons which are sending things to that target cell. It's very similar here, but it's a little bit more convoluted. In this sense, that it's a little bit, you don't have that synapse, that perfect connection between that nerve cell and something else. It's a little bit more um, reliant on just kind of passive uh, communication. So you're going to be reliant on having to use, you know, active transport to move in, things in and out of the cell versus having that really nice, well-defined synapse. Now cells can express many different hormone receptors and thus respond to many different hormones as well. So it's not like only a single cell can respond to a single type of hormone. A quick re uh, review question here. Suppose a hormone is released by the pancreas that can alter metabolism. Uh, which of the following statements would be incorrect? The target cells are in the pancreas. Certain liver cells are the receptor proteins that recognize only that hormone. The hormone could be detected in blood taken from a person's arm, or the hormone changes liver cell metabolism. Which of these is incorrect? All right. Who thinks it's A, B, C? It's A. So remember in this case, it's not, the pancreas is where it's actually being produced, where it's being sent, or sorry, where it's being sent from. The liver is actually the target, where the target would be in this case. So the answer is A. That's the incorrect statement that the target cell is the pancreas. Now the hormones can trigger response to the target cell. 
The way they do this is ultimately you've got all these hormones that are going to be circulating throughout your entire body. And when they're released, uh, but only some of them are going to cause a response in particular target cells. Thus, these target cells are simply those expressing those corresponding hormone receptors. In other words, you don't want all of those hormones to be taken up by the wrong. Going back to that previous example, which we talked about with the pancreas and the liver, the liver is going to be the only one of course that has those various cells, and those cells can probably take up other types of hormones. That liver cells are going to be the only ones that are going to be designed to necessarily take up those hormones. The hormones can be classified into a bunch of different uh, types of hormones based off of their solubility. And this can be kind of an interesting thing to think about for human health. So for obviously kind of the classic examples, water soluble and liquid soluble. What it usually breaks down to you is if it's a water soluble molecule, it's a bit of polar molecule because it can bind to that water and move around. Whereas if it's a liquid soluble one, it's going to be something that's nonpolar. That's why it tends to get associated with liquid. Now, something to think about with this is this can affect human health quite dramatically, particularly those of us that are bigger. Because you kind of keep your body is designed to store fat in that liquid form, it can often take up excess hormone to cause some very interesting reactions. Um, for instance, uh, estrogen in particular likes to be stored in fat cells, and as a result, um, those that are heavier set can be more likely to hold on to those estrogen molecules a lot more significantly than someone who isn't. And as a result, that can have direct consequences on everything from menstruation cycles to how your body responds to particular levels of activity, all this kind of fun stuff. So it's something to think about. Now, those water-soluble hormones are going to be peptide hormones. They're going to bind to receptor proteins on the outside surface of a target cell, whereas lipid-soluble hormones can diffuse across that target cell membrane because they're non-polar and bind to the receptor proteins inside. So you can actually just move those proteins on the side of the cell. Now, water-soluble hormones are going to be activated when other proteins are inside of the cell. So a cascade of reactions and negative feedback loop, if you will, sorry, positive rather, uh, will begin in the target cell when a water-soluble hormone binds to its receptor. And those messenger molecules are going to be then produced inside that target cell that are going to cause changes in the cell's activity, such as muscle contraction or cell division. Now, these water soluble hormones can cause a quick response because they're a lot faster acting. As a result, it's kind of like if you were to bring all these kind of reactions together, the fastest is slow. The nervous system, the now, ultimately, remember that these hormones are outside of the cell membrane, which is going to generate those responses inside of the cells. And these target cells are going to respond a lot more quickly because all of those participating biochemicals are already in place when the hormone binds to that receptor. It's not the case in lipid soluble hormones. Now, lipid soluble hormones are going to be there for altering gene expression. So what that means is, and we'll talk about this a little bit more in the next coming weeks. We talk about how the DNA is that backbone, that blueprint for the expression of your body, right? We can always use all of it. We want to know when to turn certain things on and turn certain things off. When we develop as a five-year-old, we have to put the different parts of our body in places so it deals with the loss. For instance, um, and this is probably a lot easier to show in other organisms, but um, if you ever kept like a dog or a cat or really any small mammal, their their aging is a lot shorter, and we see that from the age of one to ten, and it's dramatically changing from the age of one to ten for us. It's um, you're still kind of in it. But for instance, like if you have like a ten-year-old dog that breaks its leg, it's going to take it months to be able to. You know, repair all those old structures and electric systems. If we have a little bit of it can do it a little faster because it's so fast. Stem cells, all those things are 
that's something that you have to think about when it comes to these lipid soluble hormones, because those are the things that are actually controlling, well, at least partly, where some of that gene expression is occurring. There's a lot of other mechanisms that sit on top of this as well, but this is one of those mechanisms. Now, once inside the cell, these steroid hormones are gonna to bind to receptors, which are gonna form a complex. And these hormone slash receptor complexes are gonna to bind to the DNA inside of the nucleus and change the expression of the genes. It's only gonna allow for certain RNA molecules to be produced from that DNA. As a result, these reactions are a lot slower. Lipid soluble hormones alter the process of transcription to regulate which proteins are produced by the cell. And thus, because it's time to get into the mechanistic side of things, it takes a lot longer for those things to happen. So newly produced proteins can uh, cause changes in cell activity and metabolism, but there is a fairly significant place when that protein, uh, when that uh, hormone comes into the cell, versus when that new protein is being produced. All right, another quick review question here. Which of these events is unique in the action of a lipid soluble hormone? A, the hormone binds to the receptor. B, the hormone circulates in the bloodstream. C, the hormone changes the metabolism of the target. Or D, the hormone triggers production of new proteins. A, B, C, or D? Because those lipid soluble uh, hormones are going in and changing the actual expression of what's being produced, changing the, which proteins are coming out. That's why it's the only one that can trigger the production of new proteins and not a water soluble hormone. Now, hormones are released from many, many, many different endocrine glands. Now, many of these you've probably heard before, but there's a lot of them that you probably have as well. So many of the main endocrine glands and vertebrates are shown here. These organs release dozens of different hormones that stimulate and regulate every aspect of our life, with the exception of your diet. So it starts up with the hypothalamus. Um, they're shown way up in the green there. Watch there. Um, this can be produced as hormones that stimulate or inhibit the release of hormones from the pituitary gland. In other words, it's controlling just one other gland itself. That's all it's designed to do. Uh, given the works and the brain kind of makes sense, right? If your brain interacting with that particular part of the brain, and that's what's going to control the release of all that stuff on the pituitary gland. And obviously, you have the pituitary gland, which I'm sure you've probably talked about ever since like middle school health class. Uh, that's going to be the one that produces a lot of different hormones that can affect uh, target tissues directly by stimulating other endocrine glands. This is going to be kind of that primary driver to go from. Uh, way at the top of the head to controlling other endocrine glands around the body. And this is one that's very involved in things like puberty, right? You get the pineal gland, which is primarily there to produce melatonin. It's actually derived, you know, derived version of it. Um, that's going to be there for just kind of helping to regulate your sleep and put your Thyroid glands, which releases the thyroid hormones, which are there to regulate metabolism. Parathyroid glands, which secrete parathyroid hormone, which helps to regulate blood and calcium. The adrenal glands, which is just above your kidneys, which are there to promote kid and, and regulate kidney function. Go ahead, Maternal, just sit in here. Go ahead and leave. The pancreas, there are release hormones that regulate blood glucose, glucose levels, that's insulin, right? And finally, the ovaries in males or the testes in biological males, sorry, biological males and biological females, just to clarify, uh, which are there to primarily produce some of the sex hormones such as estrogen, progesterone, uh, testosterone, all that kind of fun stuff. Right. So again, hypothalamus and the pituitary oversee all the endocrine control. So together, these things are gonna kind of work together to regulate a lot of these things together. Um, and ultimately, these are kind of that control center for your brain to regularly act on the endocrine system. So the hypothalamus is going to be here. It's going to have specialized neurons that secrete those hormones into the actual pituitary. And you have the posterior and the anterior pituitary. And there you're going to have all these blood circulation points where you get blood coming in and then blood leaving. So for context, just for all this later, um, and you can the thread is usually oxygenated that's coming out of the arteries. And then you can the fluid in the patient. So that's where you're not going to have that toxicity. Ultimately, 
you're going to have all these blood connections so that way that an that uh, anterior and the posterior pituitary can get those signals from the brain, it goes in there, controls how much hormones are being produced, and then sends it back out to the rest of the body. Ultimately, the hypothalamus needs to receive sensory input from those nervous systems to treat the particular hormones that need to process. So it has those specialized neurons there to extend from the hypothalamus to tell um, the certain hormones to where they need to produce other the pituitary gland. Pretty straightforward. Now, the hypothalamus is there to adjust hormone projection specifically. So this is all related back to that negative feedback systems that we talked about earlier, where it's kind of like the thermostat in your car or the thermostat in your house, where you're trying to maintain homeostasis by either increasing or decreasing based off of when you need it. So this is, again, all coordinated by the hypothalamus, which is designed to respond to the current hormone levels and either increase them or decrease them or keep them steady based off of the levels that it's detecting in the blood. And that brings us to the posterior uh, pituitary, which is going to release hormones that are produced in uh, two hormones that are produced in the hypothalamus. You have ADH or antidiuretic hormone, which is going to stimulate the cells in the kidneys to return water to the bloodstream. So basically, in other words, if you're out like dying of thirst, so you need more uh, water in your body to help keep you at home. This is what's going to tell your kidneys to retain water instead of pushing it through the urethra uh, and actually building it up as a waste. But then it's also going to produce something called oxytocin. Now, oxytocin is going to help be there to help stimulate the ejection of milk from mammary glands, as well as introduce contractions in the uterus during childbirth. And it has a lot of other forms and functions as well, but those are kind of like the two primary ones that are most important. Now, you also have the anterior pituitary, which is there as well, which is going to be releasing the hormones from the hypothalamus to be able to kind of control that. The anterior pituitary is going to produce and secrete six different hormones. You have GH, prolactin, PSH, ATPH, FSH, and LH, and the endorphins. Now, all of these have very different and specific functions. You're probably going to need to know these. So the rate of pituitary hormone release depends ultimately on which hormones the hypothalamus secrete. And that hypothalamus is again being controlled by how it's Protecting the hormone levels in your blood and all that kind of good stuff. Now, things like uh, GH are a protein that are going to be found in cells in most of the cells in the body. Prolactin is designed to stimulate lactation. Uh, that's going to be in the mammary glands. PSH is going to promote activity in the thyroid. ACTH is going to promote activity in the adrenal cortex. FSH and LH are both going to be designed to act on the sexual reproductive organs. So that's the ovaries and the testes. And finally, endorphins, which are going to primarily be focused on interacting with your nervous system. Those are going to be things that tell you if something is good, right? Because you don't want to just have negative feedback loops and control everything. So specifically with endorphins, endorphins are considered a natural pain reliever that bind to receptor target cells in the brain. And unfortunately, this is where you get things like heroin and morphine that can bind to that same receptor and you can develop those dependencies. Um, what is it? Um, oh, there's a really nasty one in particular now that's synthetically fentanyl. Fentanyl in particular is very, very well designed to bind to these receptors and basically lock onto it. And it takes so little of it to give you that natural high that you normally get just from like your body trying to respond to a cut or something like that. And as a result, it can totally throw off that whole pain pleasure. Um, cortex in your brain. Basically what happens is, is because it's so used to that really high level of fentanyl in your system now, it's going to completely respond differently. Because it's over, it's being overstimulated constantly, right? It's telling itself that it's constantly needing that excess pleasure that's not so that way you can get things. But what happens is ultimately your body is going to not be able to respond to that stuff as well. It's going to require more and more to get you up to that threshold to be able to deal with that level of pain. So it, it kind of gets kind of screwy pretty quickly. The one I wanted to point out were FSH and LH, which are uh, focal stimulating hormones, sleep nursing hormones. These are again going to be there just to stimulate the testes and the ovaries to, relax, uh, to release sex hormones. 
ACTH. I'm not even going to try to pronounce that. Kidneys. We're going to have the thyroid stimulating hormone, TSH, which is there to increase metabolic hormone production at the thyroid gland. And these are going to be primarily responsible for interacting with the thyroid to tell your thyroid Prolactin, like we mentioned, is there for specifically in mammals to promote the production of milk in uh, biological females, in some cases, biological males, to allow the actual, you know, sustenance for credit or for, you know, kids or what have you. And finally, growth hormone or GH, which is there to promote the, the growth and development of all different tissue types. Um, I'm sure you've probably heard Uh, so you can actually increase muscle mass and all that kind of fun stuff. Like steroidal um, hormones to increase your muscle mass and all that kind of fun stuff artificially. Now, pituitary abnormalities can dramatically affect how your body size, or you can be somewhere in the neighborhood of two and a half to three feet or 12 feet tall. And that's all based off of just the overproduction or underproduction of that GH. In fact, a close friend of mine from undergrad had to take regular supplements of it since he was in middle school because his, uh, uh, the gland that was producing the, sorry, the pituitary gland as it was producing things didn't quite do it the correct way. And so as it was producing those hormones, they weren't folded properly and they just didn't work. So as a result, he had to take it as a supplement so he wouldn't be for complaint. Another quick review question here. Your doctors have to remove part of uh, a man's posterior pituitary. What's the most likely long-term consequence of the surgery? The hypothalamus is gonna produce fewer inhibiting uh, hormones. The hypothalamus will produce fewer releasing hormones. Too much water will be lost in urine. The thyroid will be understimulated, or sex hormones will be underproduced. A, B, C, D, or E. A little bit harder, right? So let's kind of talk through these here real quick. Won't the hypothalamus produce fewer hormones? Removing the posterior to hypothalamus will produce fewer releasing hormones. Yes, while the hypothalamus is connected to the posterior pituitary and doesn't interact with it a lot, it's not going to control it. D, the thyroid will be understimulated. That's the anterior pituitary, different stuff. But, um, PSH is being produced in the anterior pituitary. Finally, the sex hormones will be underproduced again in the anterior pituitary, so that's why you're not seeing. So thus, the only hormone that's being actively produced in the posterior, uh, or posterior pituitary is the one that is resulting in regulation of water, right? That's why it's the C. So in other words, if you release, or if you remove that part of your posterior pituitary, yeah, things aren't going to be perfect as far as the uh, connection between your pituitary uh, and the hypothalamus, but it's not as controlled. But that's not, you're going to be much more concerned about the actual hormones that it produces on its own. Now, a ton of hormones are going to be there to regulate the metabolism. The thyroid glands, the parathyroid glands, the adrenal glands, the pancreas, the pineal glands all secrete hormones that influence metabolism as far as like. Yeah, you know, whether you need to eat more, eat less, you're tired, you're not, all that stuff is going to be primarily controlled through that. Ultimately, though, it's the thyroid gland that sets the metabolic pace. This is going to be kind of your standard bearer. This is going to be what's primarily control of all these metabol or metabolic processes. You have two thyroid hormones, which are thyroxine and cytothyronine, which increase the rate of metabolism and target cells of all tissue types. And then you have calcitonin which is there to decrease blood calcium levels by increasing cal calcium deposition in the blood cells. In other words, if you don't have enough calcium floating around in your body, 
um, your, this will promote your body to break down bone cells so that way it can release the calcium that's in it. And this kind of weird signal with calcitonin is currently believed to be a lot of the driver behind things like osteoporosis. Now, endocrine glands, again, are going to be interacting in these negative feedback loops. So the hypothalamus, the pituitary, and the thyroid are all going to work together to put a flint, respond to, and then regulate that response. So that way, ultimately, you're going to maintain that perfect level of hormones circulating around your blood, your body and the blood. Now, the parathyroid gland in particular is going to control the calcium level. So there's four small groups of cells embedded in the back of the thyroid gland. Uh, this is all part of that parathyroid here. And that parathyroid hormone, PTH, which is produced in the parathyroid gland, is going to be there to increase calcium levels in the blood, as well as in tissue fluid, opposing to the activity of calcitonin. In other words, for every, it's kind of like the, the air conditioning to the heater. You have to have one and you have to have the other. You can't just have one of them by themselves, or you're just going to end up in this positive feedback loop that shuts down your entire body, kills you. You then have the adrenal gland, which is going to coordinate the stress response. So remember that parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system we talked about. Those are going to interface here with the adrenal gland and actually tell you to shut down. That's where that actual control is going to. So your sympathetic nervous system is going to tell your body, hey, you're going to shift on the stress. But it has to on um, and as a result, that's what's going to then tell your adrenal glands to respond. Your adrenal glands are actually going to send those hormones out to the rest of your body to decrease that digestive pressure that's happening. In other words, you're not going to you know, digest food for the next time period, as well as increase your blood pressure so you can run faster and maintain more oxygen inside of your body. Now, ultimately, each gland is going to produce a different set of hormones, and so they play a, a roles in long-term and short-term stress response. We're not going to get too far into the weeds on that. Now, each adrenal gland has two regions. There's the adrenal cortex, which is the outer portion, and that's going to be regulated by the ACTH from the inferior pituitary. And then you have the adrenal medulla, which is the inner portion of the adrenal gland, and that's where you're going to actually be releasing the hormones when they're stimulated by the sympathetic nervous system. They kind of have their own different functions. Now, the adrenal medulla is there to regulate short term stress responses. So, that's where you're going to produce things like epinephrine. I'm sure many of you have probably seen an epinephrine before, right? That's what's in it. It's a very highly concentrated form of epinephrine that you need to get into your body to stimulate that stress response. And that stress response is what's going to pull you out of that shock from the Enough that you get past that reaction. Kind of, you know, long term thing, but at least does it pretty quickly. Yes. What would, what would happen if someone got into like a fan check of stuff and got that high of stress? It's going to screw you up. So she asks what happens if like you get that really high concentration of epinephrine and you're not going through a, a major stress event. Well, how many, it's basically Totally screw your system up. It's not going to be fun. Yes. A little bit more detail, but ultimately, it's kind of like what we just mentioned with uh, the calcium versus the other version of that contrary system. What is designed to turn it up? The other one is designed to turn it down. That heater to the air conditioner. So in this case, you've got epinephrine, which is there to trigger that response, and then the epinephrine, which is going to turn it off. And you have to be that stress response. It's going to help you regulate your body to response to exercise, trauma, fear, excitement, whatever. 
This is better known as the fight or flight response. Again, kind of into this a little bit. Ultimately, these two hormones are going to affect things like increased heart rate and blood pressure. You're going to dilate your airway so breathing rates can increase. You're going to increase your metabolic rate and slow your digestion down. The adrenal cortex also is going to regulate long-term stress responses as well. So this is that more uh, casual stress. So, hey, I still have to turn in that stupid paper on Monday, but I think I'm forgetting to do it. The next day, man, we're sending it in early. Um, the adrenal cortex area is going to be producing glucocorticoids, which are going to help uh, the body mo mobilize energy, as well as raise blood pressure and reduce inflammation. Now, inflammation sounds kind of negative, and in this context, it is. Information is a really useful tool for your, uh, uh, the immune system to be able to respond to the pathogen or some sort of invasion by some sort of non human elements, right? But in some cases, information is good. But here, you want to make sure you don't have too much of it. And then you're going to turn on things and make sure. Now, under chronic response or chronic stress, these responses become really unhealthy. Just as a casual for out there, Struggling, I don't really know what I'm going to call it. We can get to the tax, 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 we can get to the it does a pretty damn good job. Which again, over a long time period of time, can destroy your heart tissue as well, so don't be under constant stress. And will suppress the immune system. So if you're chronically stressed, you're much more likely to get sick, right? That is one of the reasons why I tell you about to, or, or to be careful and not come into class when you're back in COVID. Right? The more you, you depress your immune system by stressing yourself out, coming in here when you're already sick, the more likely you are to have issues down the road. The pancreas is going to be there to regulate blood uh, glucose. Again, this is primarily done through two different hormones, both insulin and glucogen. Uh, insulin can be used. You think about like type one and type two diabetics. Um, type one means you can't produce it at all. Type two means that you can't produce it at all. You can't do it at all. You can it at all. You need that insulin there to regulate the amount of blood sugar that's present in your body. And as a result, if it's just slightly off, you can have major issues. Specifically, insulin is going to be there to lower blood glucose. In other words, like if you've got two difference that your house is going to be warm, it's going to be and we actually try to do something. Now, high glucose level tells the pancreas insulin. This insulin is going to stimulate cells to absorb glucose from the bloodstream and lower the blood glucose levels. Whereas glucogen is the opposite. Basically, if you attack it with a really low concentration of blood sugar, it's going to stimulate that the liver to release stored glucose in the bloodstream, keeping those levels steady. And again, diabetes is a result of too much glucose in the blood. Um, in diabetes, the body cells are starving for a lack of glucose, even though the glucose levels in the blood and the urine are high. Uh, this is why it's kind of a weird thing to look for, but if you ever have really foamy urine, it's because of the proteins and the sugars that like that come up and build up and give it that weird foamy bubbliness to it. And if you pee in the it's probably the same thing. Somebody may have had a really foamy urine time frame. That's usually the last time you're going to start seeing type 1 kick in. Uh, in type 2 diabetes, insulin is present, but the cells become resistant to it over time. And this is why you usually see this being developed with things like uh, individuals that are much higher than the body. Because they've eaten so many sugar foods, not just like straight up sugar, but like bread and all that kind of stuff with sugar too, right? All that stuff builds up until your body becomes more and more immune to it. And it takes more and more to trigger those reactions to the body. The pineal gland we mentioned earlier is going to be there to regulate sleep. Melatonin, which is a hormone that regulates sleep and wake cycles. Uh, darkness initiates melatonin synthesis, 
and light will inhibit it. In other words, dark syrup will light past whatever you want to go to bed, right? We're already kind of running low here, so we'll just skip past this review question here. And finally, you get to FSH and LH, which are there to regulate the ovaries and the testes. Both of these are released and they're very, very chemically similar, but they act on different tissues. At the target cells in the ovary, those two hormones are going to trigger the events that lead to the release of an egg cell ultimately. And in the testes, FSH and LH are going to stimulate sperm formation and trigger cells to release testosterone. Ultimately, all those hormones from the ovaries are going to coordinate reproduction entirely, which requires a shit ton of extra things in the process, both so progesterone and estrogen. Whereas testes, you only really have to worry about testosterone, but that is also present in females, just at a much lower level. Right. And ultimately, the hormones from the testes are going to be there to coordinate reproduction in biological males, primarily just through the production of testosterone, but there are some low-level presences of estrogen and progesterone in males. It's just not the driving force in that particular biological sex. All right. Just as a quick reminder, quiz five is due on uh, Sunday. Your biology is due on Monday, and your exam two is coming up. Make sure you are studying. As you've noticed, there are a fuck ton of vocabulary words. Anything that is on a slide like this is fair game. 